have your Bibles, turn to me to Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 4. We're going to continue our series of doing it God's way. Last week we talked about don't come empty-handed. And we recognize the fact that one of the starting points is understanding why we give and how we should never come into the presence of God without something to give. We understood when we give, it shows God honor, gratitude, and our dependence on Him. And so hopefully and prayerfully we can continue this sojourn in a very topical way that I want to express some of the truths of the Word of God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, a very familiar word, and I hope and pray that we can get fresh water from a familiar well. Here is the Word of God for the people of God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches or glorious riches in Christ Jesus. King James said, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Do me a favor, touch your neighbor, say, Neighbor, I got the hookup. Amen. Look at somebody else if they look like they don't know what a hookup is. Turn to somebody else and neighbor, I got the hookup. <laughs> Lift those hands toward heaven and say, Lord, speak. We need to hear. You may be seated in the presence of God. I got the hookup. I'm excited, my brothers and sisters. I hope that you can see the passion for which I love to teach in stewardship. Every church that I've pastored every year, I always make time to breach and broach this type of topic because I understand that it's a real and relevant thing for all of us today. I want to say this, and I hope that I don't get lambasted with tomatoes when I say this, but I really believe this with my heart, that God wants to bless us. Please don't group me with those propaganda prosperity preachers. Understand that I get mine from the Word of God. Understanding that blessings come a lot of different ways. God doesn't have to bless you with cars, cash, and clothes. But he can bless you with things that are insurmountable, some things you can't even put a price tag on. But God's desire, what God really wants, is to bless us. But yet understanding what blessings come from, blessings come through our obedience to the word of God. God lets us know that there is favor when we are faithful. And somebody can testify, you know what it is for God to dispense favor. But favor only comes when you learn how to trust lean and depend on God. In one of the areas, and hopefully we'll be free this, year, this month, I hope that through the teaching of God's word, someone somehow will be encouraged and strengthened that your walk through your discipleship would be enlarged simply because you're embracing what God's word say. God's word is very intentional to let us know that there is a reciprocity that comes, that blessings do flow to those that learn how to honor God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, Honor God with your wealth and all the first fruits of your field. And then he says, Your barns will overflow and your wine vats shall overflow. That is in the same chapter that we get perhaps one of my most favorite verses when it says, Trust in the Lord, acknowledge him in all thy ways, and all thy ways he shall order or direct your paths. We begin to understand that this is crucial and critical, that I will never be able to experience all that God has for me if I'm not willing to give all that I have to God. I want you to understand, and hopefully you get this, if you don't glean anything else from this little talk today, I hope that you glean the idea that giving really is about God trying to set priorities in our life. Because what God ultimately wants is to be first in your life. God wants to be numero uno, but oftentimes we put God first in everything else except when it comes to stewardship. We don't struggle with prioritizing God in our prayer life or prioritizing God when it comes to other areas, but we struggle in the area of stewardship, specifically giving. And so today I really want to deal with the foundational teaching that the Bible gives us. And I know that it is controversial because most people do not have the tools or the requisite understanding of what it means. But today I want to deal with the notion of the basement of giving, the foundation of giving from a scriptural standpoint, which is tithes and first fruits. I hear what you're saying because most people make it a... Uh, unusual thing. Most people I hear all the time, those pseudo-spiritual biblical scholars will suggest that we're in the new dispensation, we're under grace, that tithing is something that was considered by the law. But understand every part of the Bible, that when we are introduced to tithing, it predated the law. 
Matter of fact, we were introduced to tithing in Genesis chapter 14 when it was Abraham, he tithed, gave a tenth to Melchizedek, who was a king of that particular day. Also in Genesis 28, when Jacob received supernatural revelation, the Bible says, and he gave a tenth to God. Understand, that happened way before God ever gave the law. So tithing, this giving, this aspect of tithing was given before the law was even instituted. Because for them at that point, tithing, giving, was simply an act of worship. is a response to the goodness, the faithfulness, the sustenance of God. In other words, they gave because they recognized that by giving, I'm giving honor, I'm giving glory to the one that gave me everything I have in the first place. And so when they gave, they gave it as a way of showing admiration, showing some kind of glory, showing gratitude for God that has sustained them when they couldn't sustain themselves. Part of the misnomer for most of us why we struggle is because we don't understand what it represents. Tithing is not about just an act of giving up something tangible. It is really an act or response to a God that has been faithful. And when you gather that, you begin to understand because that is how giving was introduced. It was an act of worship. I know nowadays we've just seemingly put it in the middle of our worship experiences. We've oftentimes made it the moment of our intermission as if to suggest there are other things that's more important. But from a scriptural standpoint, giving was the high mark of worship because this was a part where everyone could participate. You didn't need a microphone to give. You didn't need a solo to give. You didn't need a title to give. Everyone could give according to how God had prospered them. And those of that particular day of antiquity would have that motion because they had their festivals that signified around their harvest from the wheat, the barley, the grape, and olives. And every time they came, they were obligated to come and bring something to God. Understand there is a difference between this notion of tithe and first fruits, and let me just share what they are. First fruits is when you receive the harvest, and when the first few sprouts in the field came, you took them straight to the temple. You did not wait till the harvest came in totality to give, but this was an offering you gave to God to say, God, I'm giving you this first before I even know what I have to work with. By consecrating the first fruits is normally a sacrificial gift. It's a first, it's a gift of faith that's saying, God, this is yours because I know you're going to bring me more to come. But tithing was when you would get your harvest in totality. Then you would to move 10% out and give the first 10 to God. Here is the difference because tithing is not just giving 10%. It's giving the first 10%. And most of us are challenged because we give 10, but you're not tithing. Because some of us look at our stuff and we pay bills, then we give God the leftovers. And it may add up to the 10, but that's not tithing. God says, it's about making me first. It's about making me the priority. Touch somebody and tell him he has to be the priority. That is the main thing that tithing, first fruit, teaches us. Is that it puts us in the mindset and the perspective that God has to go first. But our challenge is most of us get distracted. Most of us look at our bills. Most of us look at what we think we are losing. And because of that, we then get skittish and scared. And we do not stay faithful to God. We give God the scraps. But we are willing to give everybody else the best of what we have. Understand that giving, this stewardship, doing God's way is not just about your money. It's about how your heart prioritizes God. And the challenge for most of us, that's why this gifting, this teaching oftentimes falls upon stony hearts is because you think it's about money. God says, no, it's about honor and glory. And when you learn how to trust me, you'll see that I can put everything in perspective for you. That's what gets us to this point because I want to push that what happens when we honor God with our first and I, there are many texts I could lift up. There are many verses of scripture that I could use as a launching pad of teaching. But I wanted to come to a familiar passage, one that I believe oftentimes is misdefined and oftentimes used out of context. It is this text found in Philippians chapter 4, this passage of scripture where we hear Paul make the declaration, My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Understand when you put this text in context, this comes in one of Paul's perhaps most joyful missions. His, his book to the church in Philippi while he's in jail in Rome. And those of you who study, study scripture will recognize this is perhaps Paul's favorite congregation. There is no condemnation at all in this little book or letter. It is simply a word of encouragement and gratitude. 
Part of that was because of how they remained faithful in their giving, faithful in their stewardship, and faithful in continuing the work of the kingdom. You got to catch this because this was not Paul's largest church he planted. It was not the most well affluent. It was not the one that was well to do, but yet they remained faithful in spite of their circumstances. Because what had happened, when you study it, you'll know that this church was not made of big ballers and shot callers. It was made of people who simply decided to keep God first. And that's how God encouraged them through Paul. Because when we come to chapter 4, we really see a thank you letter being penned by Paul. Because at that time, there was severe issues happening at the home church in Jerusalem. They were running into a lot of issues. They were trying to stay faithful in the midst of their problems. So the apostles and leaders of that church had asked all the churches that were planted if they would send a sacrificial gift back to the home church so they could continue their ministry. Paul had sent them a letter. And you'll notice that whenever you read some of them, some of the churches had issues. They had a problem giving, but not this church in Philippi. Even though they didn't have a lot, they joyfully gave and sacrificed, sent not just a gift to the church in Jerusalem, but also sent a gift to Paul. Paul had given up a lot to be a minister to the gospel. He used to make tents in Tarsus, but now he was simply a full-time apostle to the Gentiles. And this small, fledgling church decided to show their heart, their gratitude, by sacrificing unselfishly for the kingdom of God. And that is why Paul, in chapter 4, verse 19, was able to say, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. I need to make sure that you understand where verse 19 goes, because this is not a text for everybody. This is not an unconditional promise with guarantees. You just can't say this if you have a selfish, stingy heart. This was a conditional verse that was meant to tell those who had sacrifices and kept God first that God will repay you and hook you up. The problem with too many of us is you going around claiming this verse but haven't done your part. And God said, I'm not obligated to take care of no one that hasn't first honored me. He said, you're going around as if I gave you a blank check but you can do it all you want. I'm not cashing it, nor am I endorsing it, because I have to be first before you can get the promise. And the challenge, my brothers and sisters, is that oftentimes we miss out on the hookup of God because God only desires to hook up those who spiritually sacrifice and are unselfish when it comes to the kingdom. God says, if you do your part, watch how I begin to give you supernatural provision, protection, and position. I can hook you up greater than any person can hook you up understand this me this notion is through reciprocity that it only comes when you keep me first and that's what our text want to slip up today I want to share some of the truths of this verse because I believe it gives us some powerful things how could Paul make without reservation and hesitation the fact and make the claim that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory you'll note if you read this I hope that you take time when you get home read this chapter in entirety because Paul seems to commend them for their giving. Note what he says, verse 10, he likened them to a tree that was flourishing. As if to suggest you had strong roots because only trees with strong roots will produce some fruit. He says it's like you got a great investment, verses 14 through 17. And, and because you invested wisely, watch how God gives you the dividends. In verse 18, he likens it to a sacrifice that is laid on the altar of God. That once it is burned, the sweet fragrance reaches the nostrils of God where God is pleased. I wonder, what does your offering smell like to God? And he said, because you sacrifice. Understand what he means. It's not about quantity. It's about quality. And because you sacrifice, watch what God does. God gives the ultimate hookup in verse 19. Let's look at this hookup, if you will, real briefly. Because why was he able to give this promise with such certainty? The first thing is, Paul knew the source of the hookup. My God. Don't miss that. Here he makes a personal claim to God. He, he does not say a God, but he says, my God. As if to suggest that Paul knew something about the greatness of the God he was claiming to be the promise keeper. 
that the reason he had confidence in the hookup is that he had evidence and experience with the one that was going to handle his business because he knows what it is to take care of his people. I've learned this sometimes. Most people who struggle with their giving struggle because they have a skewed view of God. And sometimes we don't believe God has everything. Oftentimes we struggle because we've minimized and made God small. So if you see God as small, then you only think he can do small things. I tell people all the time that really our issue is not with God, but how we perceive God. And the question I have to ask today, what does God look like in your life? Is he only a God that can pay a few bills? Is he only a God that can just do a few things? But if you serve a God, like scripture says, has a cattle on a thousand hills, if you serve a God that's Jehovah Jireh, the God that shall provide, if you serve a God that's Jehovah Rophi, a God that heals, I need to know today, what kind of God do you serve? And most of us wrestle and struggle because we do not see God in his highness. We do not see God in his greatness. Every now and again, you need to remind yourself what kind of God you serve. And I'll admit part of the challenge with the 21st century church is that we've made God a midget. We've made him smaller as if God is something that we can just put on a platter and just begin to move him to and fro. Do you know what kind of God we serve? He's the creator God. He's the beginning before the beginning even began and he'll be the end after the end ends. He is our amazing God. Somebody ought to testify. I know something about the source of who God is and when you know who God is, you're not tripping because you know what kind of God you serve. Oh, I need to ask the inventory of the congregation today. Touch somebody and tell them, do you know who God is? Matter of fact, I don't need a microphone to tell you how good God is. He woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. He put activities in my limb. He, he allowed me to live on another day. That's an amazing, awesome, incredible God. and I can give you this guarantee is I know the source God he's provider God it's not job gyra it's not government gyra it's Jehovah gyra he is our God but notice not only the source of the hookup but this one verse also gives us the scope of the hookup shall supply all my needs okay let me help you at the 1145 service I want you to know there's certain terms when you read them in scripture you ought to just lift up your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Some words when you run into in scripture, they ought to just make you get excited. Let me read it again. Shall supply all my needs. Okay, we Baptist, so you need it a third time. I'm cool. I come to teach you today. Shall supply all. Okay, let, let, let me help you. He does not say may supply. Does not say I'll think about supplying. Does not say I might supply. He says I shall. Let me give you something deep. Touch your neighbor and say, Pay G about to drop some real knowledge on you. Because I want you to know all simply means all. That means every need that you have. He got a supply to meet that need. Okay, okay, I, I understand. You like the rest of the, the groups today. You like the rest of the services. You rather it say, shall supply all of our wants. But somebody can testify there's a real big difference between your wants and your needs. Matter of fact, some wants, you ought to be glad God don't give them to. But every need means necessity. It means whatever we're lacking. It means whatever we cannot get on our own. It says God shall supply all. Well, I see, I understand. That's why some of us are limited in 21st century. That's why you don't get it because you think every need has to be something done in a tangible way. You think that if you get more money, that's meeting the need. You think if you get cars, clothes, and cash, that means meeting the need. Baby, I've got to this point in my life with God. I, there's some needs I have you can't put a price tag on. There's some stuff that I need God to supply that you can't get it from a bank account. You can't get it from a check. I need peace of mind. I, I need some joy. I, I need some joy. I need some. I, is there anybody beside me that can testify? I need some needs. And I tell you, there's some needs that Donald Trump can't give me. Barack Obama can't give me. Oprah can't give me. That only the God of Lord and the King of Kings can give me. Touch somebody and tell them I need that need supply. 
Oh, I look at somebody and tell them, baby, you can have a nice big bed and not get no rest. You need some rest. You need a God that can give you stuff you can't get from nowhere else. I need it supplied. Oh, my need. He said, listen, this is what kind of God you serve. But he'll, he, he meets needs. He, he, he enjoys supplying needs. I, I want to move on from here because I got a whole lot more to teach you, but somebody needs to know I don't care what need you got. He can supply it. Why you say that, Pastor? Not only the source, not only the scope, but notice the surplus. How is he going to supply the needs according to his riches in glory? See, see, you, you looking at riches as if that means gold coins, platinum, bling, bling. No, this word riches literally can mean graces. He said, according to his grace. Okay, okay, that may not be much for you, but can I tell you what shouted me in my study? Is that God said, Goodman, here's the thing. No matter what need you got, I always have more grace. He said, here is the point. Your needs are measurable, but my grace is immeasurable. Which means no matter what need you got, I always have more grace. Can I tell you how good God is? Sometimes God said, I won't even move the need. I'll give you grace to handle whatever you got to go through. Come here, Paul. Paul said it this way. I had a thorn in my flesh. I prayed three times, Lord, take this thorn from me. And God said, I ain't going to take it, but guess what I'm going to give you? My grace is sufficient. Now, this ain't for everybody. This is for the mature saints in here. How many have ever experienced the sufficiency of God's grace? Well, God will give you grace, and you're trying to figure out how you're still standing. Grace. Is there anybody that can testify? I ain't nothing but a grace case, PG. Because as I look over my life, the only way I made it is God has given me his grace. Anybody can testify. I got grace. I got more grace than I got bills. I got more grace than I got sin. I got more grace than I got mistake. It don't matter what my need is. He got grace. It is a powerful thing. Because grace is simply an acronym that simply means this, God's resources at Christ's expense. That he says, according to his grace in glory. Glory is how God's grace is manifested and operated. Here's why he said, I'm going to give you my grace. Because the more grace I give you, the more glory comes to me. Which means I need you to be grace because the more graced you are, the more glorified I am. So I need you to experience my grace because when you get that grace that grandma said is amazing grace, then you, all you can say is it was nobody but God. Oh, okay, okay. Let me ask somebody in the balcony. Is there anybody that can testify it was nothing about his amazing grace that simply made me say, Lord, it was nobody but you. It, I mean, I thank you. It was only you that allowed me the opportunity. Thank you for your grace. That comes through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the mediator, who is the propitiator, who is the one that originates, gives us grace. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, Paul makes it clear. And matter of fact, this promise was so good, he had to start singing after he said it. That's why verse 20 is a doxology. It's for God, notice what he said, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Which means that after you experience his grace, you got to give him some praise. <laughs> That's why I don't understand how some people can come to church and sit down like you are not on the lawn. God's been too good to you for you not to give him some praise. Now, I know y'all done shouted a little bit earlier, but somebody owes God an overdue, a layaway praise where you can say, Lord, when I think of the goodness of you and all he's done for me, excuse me, I, I got enough praise to shout from here to Timbuktu. I got to give God glory and praise. He's an awesome God. I said, before you start shouting, that's for those that put God first. You put God first, you got the hookup. But not everybody put God first. So everybody can't say amen on that. Some of y'all stood, shouldn't be standing. Don't worry about it. I'm coming to help you. I'm here to help you. I'm your pastor. I'm your main man. I'm your therapist today. Let me help you. Because everybody that's standing up talking about you blessed, you ain't blessed. Some of us are cursed because the antithesis of not giving God first means you're putting God last. By putting him last, 
means you're cursed. See, see, one level, when you honor God, he blesses you. But when you dishonor God, he says you're cursed. That, that's what brings us to Malachi. And, and I know oftentimes we don't read these little books in the Bible, but Malachi is a powerful book. It is one of the last words God says before he goes on a 400 years hiatus before he speaks again through his son Jesus. This book, Malachi, is intriguing because it's not a book that's written to the world. It's written to the church, the temple. Because at this time, the people of God had forgotten who God was. God had been good to the children of Israel, brought them out of Egypt, let them cross Red Sea, let them have everything sustenance in the wilderness, even allowed them to enjoy the promises of Canaan. He kept them even when they couldn't keep themselves. But somehow, some way in their history, they forgot about God. They didn't want to honor God. Somehow they got infiltrated to start to think that they could do everything by themselves. They were so blessed that they forgot who was sending the blessings. And so now they started to take the spiritual disciplines at lax. They decided that they could do things on their own. If grandma was here, she said they were getting too big for their britches. And God had got tired. God was insulted. You know, God really hates when he does stuff for us and we don't acknowledge it. So when you read Malachi chapters 1 and 2, he gets mad. He's not mad at the world. He's mad at the temple. And he starts looking at all the desecration and issues that they're facing. There's more sin rampant, adultery, divorce, all kind of social injustices. And God says that's because you try to do it on your own. And he said the reason you've done it is because you haven't put me first. I'm going to tell you how jacked up this situation was. God said, listen, I'm going to let you produce stuff, but it ain't going to be blessed. So, so I'll let your crops grow, but I'll still let you roll in debt. I, I'll let you get married, but I'll let hell into your marriage. I'll let you get some positions, but then I'll cause hell and high water to come. So why? Because you decided you want to do it by yourself. He said, because I will never enter something that I'm not invited in. Even the priests, he said, even those who are in the temple, he said, listen, y'all, you're getting too lax. You're forgetting what your main call is. And he said, basically, you're now living under a curse. When you read Malachi, I hope you take time. It's, it's a real short passage of book. It's a real book, short book, but it gives us some real deep things because it says in that Hebrew, it says you are cursed with a curse. He says you are doubly cursed. And when we keep reading Malachi, we understand what happened. The reason that God was getting distant, the reason God was hurt, is because they lost their priority in prioritizing God. You forgot to bring me my gifts. I gave you everything you have, but you can't honor me. I'm the one that blessed you, but you want to act like you did this on your own? I'm the one that provided for you, gave you rain, gave you the land to put the seed in, gave you the seed to sow, and now I'm the one that you're going to disrespect? And here he basically seems to give us a scathing view. Here, I would not be angry with God if God just lifted his hands and said, I'm done. But I love Malachi 3 because it is here that he says there's a remedy to this curse. And he gives us this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Notice how he opens. He said, listen, I'm the Lord. I do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. My standards don't shift. My standards don't change because there's a new president. My standards don't change because there's a new dispensation. My standards don't change because you turn the pages into a New Testament. My standard is still the same. And that's what I love about God. We can go through all the rim and roll that we see happening. God says, my standard is still the same. And he said, the only thing I've been asking you to do is honor me, then your tithes and offering. He said, just bring me what belongs to me. How are you not going to give me something that I gave you firsthand? How are you going to act like you're the one that brought it? He said, bring me all the tithes and offerings to the storehouse. He actually asked a serious question. Will a man rob God? That's deep to me because notice there's a difference between being a robber and being a thief. Thieves, wait till you go to sleep or wait till you go out of town. Case the joint. Then go in and get your stuff. Robbers, they see you straight to your face. They ain't even got to wear a mask. They'll just walk up to you, give me all that you got. And he made that analogy to say that's how the people were when they came to the temple. They acted like they were giving, but they were really robbing God. He said, I don't care about what clothes you got on. You come tap the basket. You can do all that you want. You ain't honoring me because your heart's not right. You're not putting me first. You're robbing God. I wonder 
If we were to put our APB out today in the sanctuary, how many robbers would be in Tabernacle Baptist Church? But he said, I want you to get right. And what I want you to do is, I first of all, I want you to understand, it's about bringing the tithes and offers into my storehouse. It was a special place in the temple where they stored up the gifts so that they could continue to do ministry. He said, this was to help the widows and orphans and those to serve the priests and Levites who sacrificed themselves for there'll be meat in my house. Not a T-bone steak, not a sausage biscuit. That's not meat. Meat is the manifestation of ministry to impact the world. He said, my house can't do work if there's no meat in it. And it's up to you to bring the meat. One survey was lifted that all believers were surveyed a few years ago. They said they give less than 2% back to God out of their gross income. And yet we have the unmitigated gall to get upset because we say the church ain't doing nothing. Get mad because we say this and we say that. But yet, what have you provided to produce the meat? But he said, listen, if you do this, I'll make some promises to you. I want to show you some things right here in this illustration. There's some of us today that need to see how serious this is because I want you to understand what God means when he says put me first because most of us need a visual to be able to understand how important this is. I want to share with you a simple illustration because most of us, we think that this tithe, this 10%, this first thing that God gives us is, is, is a big thing. So y'all come on, let me see one. Come on guys, let's roll. He said, give me one. You got to give me one first. And you can take care of the rest. So this one goes to God. Jimmy. Jimmy. Okay. okay. Jimmy, you got it? This is the fourth time we done did this today, Jimmy. Okay. He said, all right. Vegetables. So get one. He said, all right, put one and put the rest of the nine on my table. It's a soup, Jimmy. The soup, Jimmy. The soup. The soup, Jimmy, the soup, Jimmy, the soup. The soup, Jimmy, the soup. Okay, get the nine. That's, that's only two, Jimmy. I got to show the full illustration, Jimmy. Get the soup, Jimmy. How you going to give me the... That, that ain't the soup, Jimmy. Give me the soup, Jimmy, the soup. Okay, Jimmy. Yes, the soup, Jimmy. Under the table, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy, have you got it? Okay, okay, guys. We're going to get this guy. We got it. We got it. We got you. They're going to get it together. We good. We good. Get the soup. Okay. Come on. Okay, guys. Ramen noodles. One and nine. I need us to catch up, guys. We done did this full time today. We got it. Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. Just go with Z. We're, we're going to let you. It's okay. Thank you, Jimmy. We appreciate you, Jimmy. Where's the soup, Jimmy? We need the soup. One popcorn, one popcorn. All right. They say they ain't got no soup, so we're going to put the soup up, says Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. I love you, Jimmy. Jimmy, you're killing me, Jimmy. Okay. Let's get it together. Here we go. Give me something else. Okay. Here is the mini ravioli. I need one of these right here and nine on God's table. We got it. We coming, guys. Pray for us. Jimmy, Jimmy holding this up. Vienna sausage. He said, give me one. Nine over there. We got that? What else we got? Tuna salad. One right here. He said, God, give me mine. God said, give me mine. Nine over there. High C. Give me one. Put nine over there. We got it? Toaster's, taster's choice, house blend. Coffee, put nine over there. Nine over there. What else we got? Okay, we got, what's this? Kicking Sloppy Joe. Okay, one right here. Nine over there. Just put them on there, guys. Let's go. What else we got? All right, we got some pretzels. One right here. This all, got, God said, just give me mine, and I'll give you this. Okay, we got, um... El Paso from a Hispanic festival, cheesy nacho bowl. Tiquerico <laughs> man, that's how it is. So we get nine of them over here. We got those nine. Y'all got the nine? Where the nine? This is one, two. Classic hummus right here. Put nine over there. We, we,
Chicken salad. Put everything, just put everything on the table. Because apples apple right there. One apple. All right, he said, look. Jimmy, you're losing some of my blessing. I need all my blessings on my table. He said, give me mine. This is my 10%. Then I'll give. All this is yours. He said, now, if you honor me, put everything on the table, Jimmy. Everything on the table, Jimmy. Ev everything on the table. Ev there's another. Everything on the table, Jimmy. Everything on the table, Jimmy. Everything on the table. Everything on the table. Everything. Everything on the table, Jimmy. God bless. Thank you, Jimmy. High five, Jimmy. High five. Y'all, thank God for Jimmy Stokes. Let's bless God for him. Woo! He said, look. He said, give me mine. This it. This it. He said, and I'll bless you with this. But y'all, here's the crazy thing. Now see, this is all he said he wants. This is all he said. Give me this first. And I'm going to give you all. I'm, this is yours. Okay, y'all, make sure you catch this. This is God's. This is mine. Now, here's what's crazy is that's not it. He says, part of the blessing is, I'm going to rebuke the devourer for your sake. You, you, in that day, they had agriculture. So they would have bugs and locusts that would try to eat their harvest up. So God said, you ain't got to worry about that. I'm going to be your repellent. Stuff that want to try to come eat your stuff up, I'll get it out of the way. That unexpected bill, don't worry about it. I'm going to rebuke that. That, that crazy friend that's always asking for money, I'm going to rebuke that too. You ain't got to worry about that. That family member that's always trying to get some money, they're going to lose your number. Rebuke, rebuke. That unexpected school bill you didn't know you had to pay, he said, no, don't worry about that. That's going to be taken care of. All that stuff that's trying to eat you. Matter of fact, don't worry about it. That little unexpected car bill, you were trying to figure out how your transmission went out. Don't worry about it. I'm going to keep that straight. You ain't got to worry about none of that. That hole that was going to come in your roof, that was going to cost you a whole lot of money. Don't worry about that. You ain't got to worry about your roof no more. I'm rebuking the devourer for your name, for my name. Say, y'all missing it. Let's say this out. Then he said, not only that, I'm going to preserve what you have. He then says, I'm going to make you a delightsome nation. In other words, he said, listen, Israel, I want to get it to the point that when people see you, all they can say is, you sure enough is blessed. I'm going to make the nations that don't even like you, Israel, have to say you are a blessed nation. Can I tell you how nice it is when God lets you get your shine on and make you smell so good that even your haters got to be like, I may not like them, but they show he is blessed. You're going to have people come to you and talk about, baby, you done lost some weight. Nah, I'm just blessed. I'm just blessed. I'm just blessed. I'm just blessed. I'm just, anybody, any blessed folk in here that you say, Lord, I just want you to let me get my shine on. I just want you to have, he said, listen, I'll take care of all that if you just do this. But that ain't it. That ain't it. I'm done. Because here's the crazy thing. Because I used to think you just living off night. He said, oh, he said, good man, oh, I'll rebuke the devourer. I I'll make you the license nation, but I'll open up the window. Now, now, how many of you got houses? You do know there's more than one window in a house, right? He said, because you trust me, I'm going to start opening up windows and start pouring you out. I need you all to pour it, Jim, pour it, Jimmy, out of blessing you can't even handle. So you think it's just 90. I'm giving you 90 plus. Y'all ain't feeling me today. He said, if you just trust me and honor me, I'm done. Everyone's standing. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Let's stand. Listen, listen, let's stand. I'm done. I, I, I don't even know how much more I can show and express it. Because we, we arguing over this? This is what you can't afford to give God? This is what you're complaining about? This table? This is what you're mad about? And paying everything else and saying, you know, I can't give God his. This versus this. I don't know about you. I don't know which table you want. God said, my standards are the same. I ain't going to raise the prices. I ain't going to raise taxes on it. Here it is. This is the beginning. Just give me this. And you guaranteed to have this. See, the reality is, here's the problem. We can't trust God enough for that. But then we run into financial difficulty and we, we get mad. God said, all I, all I ask is you put me first. If you put me first, 
watch what I can do for you. I got to this point, and I really am, and I enjoy teaching on this because I am an example. I'm a witness to the power of giving. All my life, that's all I've known. I, I can't explain to you how God has blessed me in such innumerable ways. I, all I knew is when I was growing up, my grandparents instilled in me to give to God. I, I'll be honest with you, that's all I know. Even when I was in college and I had my little Pell Grant, I still gave to God. And God has allowed me to go to school free. God allowed me to experience things for him. My first church, I was making peanuts, traveling an hour and 45 minutes one way. But God, in that moment, I was getting peanuts. I said, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm, I'm ain't going to give you just 10. I'm going to give you 20. From this little bit I got, and I'm going to tell you how God blessed me. God allowed me to buy my first house, get my first car. I'm still trying to figure out how God did it. Matter of fact, can I tell you how God will bless you? God will start just giving you opportunities. Some of y'all, you miss it. God can sometimes bless you, not with money, but with a relationship. He'll hook you up with the right person to connect you with the right person next business venture he'll he'll get you in the right I ought to have some people that can testify I, I'm telling you I'm I'm a byproduct of seeing God because I trusted God he didn't always give it to me in money he didn't have to he allowed me to meet the right people that got me in the right doors he allowed me to, to get opportunities I'm still trying to figure out I'm just a little kid from Greensboro North Carolina nobody really in my family to preach I'm trying to figure out how I'm in seminary barely trying to understand how I'm traveling the world preaching I'm not the greatest preacher but God would say because I can trust you because you honor me and it's not an issue for you you ain't begrudging giving me what you, you you give it to me and say Lord it's on you can I tell you the only place in scripture that we are obligated and commanded to try God is in our finances he said, test me. Test me. Try me. See if I don't do what I said I'm going to do. And the problem I need to ask today, I need to ask somebody here. When are you going to stop tripping and start trusting? What else does God have to prove to you? He said, if you just give me this, start here. Show me. Show me that you're honest with me. Show me that you honor me. Show me that you honor me. Show me. And watch if I do this. Listen, doors of the church are open. I'm done. I'm done.